When you think about looking better at work, are you just thinking about your clothes, which of course does matter? But are you also thinking about looking better with the voice that you use, the advice that you give, and your presence to other people? That's what we'll talk about today. Don't wait your turn. Bet on yourself and have the confidence to stand up and say, my time is now. Robert F. Smith. Today, we're going to talk about the second part in the book Rise by Patty Azzarello. This is where we find out how we can look better, not only with our physical appearance, but with our presence with other people. This one's hard for me. I always fundamentally believed my whole life that what you look like does not matter. It's who you are. It's the work that you do. That's what's important. And I've been known to bristle quite a bit if someone says, it's how you look too. You have to dress up more. You have to look better about it. That it made me a little depressed when I saw this chapter because I think of the content of people's character as being the most important thing. But when you actually read it, it has a lot of sense when it comes to looking better. First of all, she said this isn't about a fashion or a beauty contest or anything like that. It just means that you don't want your appearance to be distracting from people seeing your main competence, the things that you're really good at. You want to make sure that at least how you look allows people to see the real you. So that means, do you have clothes that fit? Or do you always look rumpled? Or do you always look like you just rolled out of bed? All those types of things might be able to hurt you. On some rare occasions, it may help you. And I think about James Altucher. He's got this great podcast. He has crazy hair. He's a character. But because he made this part of his persona, it now bolsters him to do that. But I think you can only get there once you've been successful. You can't be weird and unique and crumpled and all those things when you're starting out or you're trying to build your reputation at work. Unfortunately, people will judge you based on those types of things. You have to look like you've made an effort in how you look and how you appear to other people. And even when we've been working remotely and have remote meetings, we still have to look good. We still have to not be in dark, creepy rooms. We have to not have a gigantic mess with us. Again, you want to make sure it's not about being a model. It's about wearing clothes that make you feel good, that fit right. And that's what's really going to help. Next time she talks about having relevance in the company, and she said that she's seen a lot of people who try to work their way up in a company and they're never recognized. They feel invisible. They feel like their work is not appreciated and that no one in the company really appreciates anything that they do inside that company. So she gives some ways to try to bring back relevance into the career that you're doing. First, she says, be a translator. And that means that you're able to describe things to your boss that's important. Maybe you're able to take the customer's concerns or what the customer is really doing out there in the real world and bring them to leadership. You're acting as a translator to other voices, either outside in the community or outside in your customer base that is important so that you make sure that you're actually giving a clear communication to leadership or your boss about what's going on out there or why this particular topic is going well or not going very well. She also says it's important that we use what she calls your outside voice. And I think this is funny because sometimes I don't do a very good job of this because I tend to be pretty much me everywhere you meet. I'm like this at home. I'm like this at work. I'm pretty much me all the time. But what happens is if you talk, whatever is rattling around in your brain and not looking at what that person really needs to hear, they're going to walk away from that conversation disappointed. If you gave them too much information, if you gave them irrelevant information, if you backed all the story all the way up to, let me just tell you how this began and they don't care, you're not going to be thought of very well. So in order to do a job well, she says, you have to make sure that you are adding value, and that includes in your conversations. That means you're telling leadership, other coworkers, the important things, not just everything. And that also means not going above their head either. 
So if you have a lot of jargon, there's a lot of abbreviations in your organization, and your boss is just not that person who knows all the individual abbreviations that are going on, again, be the translator by giving them the relevant information in the format that they're expecting it. It's always good to make money in a company. Companies are there to make money. So if you can find ways of making your products better, of making sales better, that always looks good for you too. Or making sure that you come up with ways to make the team better, the company better, or improving a process that really needs help or could be improved. And then she talks about personal brand. We talked a little bit about having a personal brand versus an elevator speech. And if you're interested in that, that was episode 19, your personal elevator speech. She says that even if you don't believe you have a personal brand, what you have is what other people in the company think of you. And these come from two different things. One, your behavior. How do you act? A lot of people come up with assumptions about you based on how you act. And then the second one is consistency. We talked about that before. So they can say, wow, this person's really insightful but they're super inconsistent and they never really do a good job all the time. That's what people are going to think about you. She said that it's better to be consistently bad than inconsistently good. And the reason she says that is because people will learn not to trust you and it'll really make them angry when you're inconsistent. Your brand comes from those two things. Try to figure out a way to create high expectations and not have big letdowns. She gives a list of questions in the book about how other people see you. And she said that you should probably take 15 people from your life, from your work, past colleagues maybe, and ask them these questions. So you want to know how that person sees you. What do they always think about you when they see either your work or your home life? Find out how you relate to others at work. What do you expect from people? What do you, what are you good about giving to people? Do they like you? Do they try to avoid you? Do you talk too much? Whatever it is. But how do you relate to other people at work or at home, depending on what the setting of this conversation is? And then how does your personality and values affect what you offer? So that might be that you're great at working, but you're a real crab or you're super nice, but you don't really work very hard and you don't really work very hard to get projects done, whatever it is. But what does your personality do that could affect others? The last question is, is what outcomes do you associate with me being involved in a project? Sometimes when you look at other people and their projects, they're great at putting the last dot over the eye. Everything's in place. Everything's well organized. Then she said that when you define your brand attributes, you want to make a list of all the things that you're known for. List all the thoughts about who you are and what you're great at. And this is important. Compare that list with the list that you got from others. Look at the things that make you different from others. So one of the things I think that's different about me, I like public speaking. I like talking in large groups of people. I like to be with people a lot. That's one thing that helps me with my customers because I never get tired of being with them. That might be something that sets you apart from other people. Take all the long list of categories about what defines you and then try to list what she said the three to five most important things are. What do you want to be known for out of this entire list? And she said that these things now become your theme for your brand. She says it's important that we always are unique. Everyone can be kind of cookie cutter about what they do, generically work hard, come to work on time, leave late, whatever it is. But instead, you want to make sure that you try to be unique. Don't be like everybody else in the company. You came to this company and were probably hired because you have skills, backgrounds, opinions, experiences other people don't have. And so that experience will help you do better than maybe someone else with the very same types of skills you have. But you have to remember that you have to be who you are and whatever it is that makes you unique. You'll know when you're done with your brand building when every day in every meeting and every memo and every email, every conversation supports the brand that you have. She said that once you have your brand, it'll make you feel confident because you'll know the things that make you special and the things that you're good at. And you'll know how to be you and how to really press your strengths into that. 
And she also says, just don't think about one brand. You probably have a brand for home. You have a brand from work. You have a brand at church. She says it's important that you figure out who your stakeholders are. And stakeholders is a business term that a lot of people use, but it's basically anyone who has a bearing in a particular project. Stakeholders may be your boss. They care how the project goes. Your customers, they definitely care how your project goes. Maybe the people on the team care about it too, because if you start failing at the project, they're going to have to jump in and help you. And so it's important that when you're looking at your project and you're looking at who you should really look good to, not just in the physical sense, but in the work sense, it may be all those people. And then she talks about influencers. And these are people who are not necessarily directly connected to this project. It may be your boss's boss. It may be other people in leadership in the company. But you also want to make sure their impression of you really matters, too. It may be the project manager who's working with you. So she says that whenever we figure out who our stakeholders are and we decide that we want to look better to them, not just in the physical appearance, but in everything, that one, we could just leave it to chance and hope that they see the true us. We can proactively talk to them and manage what they think about us, not just in looks again, but their whole perception of what it is we are and what we're good at. And it's much better to guide that perception of you than it is to just leave it to chance because it's really hard to fix. And she said that the reason that a lot of people feel they need to leave their company in order to get a promotion is because they're actually doing the very thing she's talking about when they go on a new job interview. What do you do when you go to a new job interview? You put the makeup on, you're looking nice, you're feeling confident, and you go into the short meeting You're managing what other people think of you. The very thing that you're trying to avoid in your current job because you don't feel like doing it, you actually do when you go on a new job interview. If you probably just did these things at your job, you'd probably also get the promotion too. So think about all the things that you would be doing if you were looking for a new job and that might give you insight about what you probably need to do in your current job. And that if there's people in the room who don't know you, that can sometimes be weird, especially when they're leadership and there may be higher leadership than you already know. So you want to make sure that when executives or leadership in your company talk about who should get the next promotion or who should take on this big project, people think of you because if they're not thinking of you, they're going to think of somebody else. And so that's a way of looking better, building trust, doing all those things will help you be at the top of their mind when opportunities come inside your business. And then she says, make sure that you're not annoying. Even if you're talented, that will hurt your career. She even says that you should make a list where it lists all the influencers and stakeholders in your project and in your company. Why are they relevant to you? What is their outcome that they want you to do? And when you're talking to different influencers, different stakeholders, make sure that you have a different communication plan with each of them. Your boss might want more details. Your boss's boss probably wants less details, but they want to know the successful outcome of what your plan is about. That whoever you're talking to within your company or your customers, it's relevant to them and it makes you look competent and trustworthy. She also says to be brief. You don't want to waste anybody's time and you can just see that when you're wasting people's time, they're cringing on the inside and not thinking very well of you So make sure that you keep everything that you're saying to the point for that exact person. She had a special word for people who are working remotely. And a lot of people right now are working remotely. She says, it's up to you to make sure that you don't disappear from that company. You have to make sure that people still think about you when you're not there. I've always been really good at this when it comes to customers, because when I work remotely for a customer and I'm on a project, I want them to know. I've been working really hard for you today. I got all these tasks done. The project is going just as we hoped it would be because when they don't hear anything, they don't know if they're not hearing from you because the project is failing or maybe you're not working on it or maybe it's great and it's fine, but they don't know. All they hear is that deafening silence. So making your presence felt even when you're not with your customer or at your company, so important. I like this. 
She advises people to be the first one in on a conference call. That way you can greet everyone who joins the call, chat with them a little bit, and they know that you're on the phone call. If you join late, you might completely disappear from the meeting and no one will even know that you're there. And another way to build relationships with other people is give them positive feedback. If you have a boss and they just did some incredible project and the company just announced it, congratulate them for it. Talk a little bit about it. Ask some questions. That makes them know that you've been paying attention not only to what's going on in the company, but to them. She said that part of the problem she always had when she was not getting promoted and feeling like she was overlooked is the fact that she was practically invisible in the company itself, that no one knew her, no one was watching out for her. She was getting all her work done, but no one really understood what she did. And so that you have to make an effort to communicate to your stakeholders regularly so that you're on the front burner and they know who you are. And so when you're communicating things to people that you want to make sure that you get them excited, interested in your project, you have to think about whether you're boring them or are you educating them? What's the point of the conversation that you're going to have with them? That you want to make sure that people's viewpoint of you or the project has improved, that they will know why you're different, but you want it to be memorable. And that means that you want to make sure that your communication is interesting and relevant to them. And she says, unfortunately, a lot of times we are being judged harshly. That once you're visible, you're out there. Everyone can see what you're about. Everyone can see what you're doing. That also might mean that people might start judging you. She said that sometimes promotions or work projects or anything at work can be a little bit like the gong show, which was this old game show where people would get up and sing or do an act or do something. And then when the judges found that it was boring or unexciting, they would bang a big gong in the studio. And that meant you were over. So unfortunately, work is a little bit like that too, that when we've lost people, sometimes we've really lost them. And so it's important that we keep that clear, good conversation going so that the gong doesn't get to us. She said that's important that you show a good personal presence about you. That's hard sometimes to learn how to do. A lot of times that has to do with clear speaking and confidence. You want to make sure that you always have that confidence and that you're not being defensive. If people start asking you questions about your project, are you getting defensive about it and sniping back at them? Or are you calmly explaining why you think What it is they're suggesting isn't either going to happen. Make sure you can answer good questions. Don't get nervous. And again, we've mentioned this before in the podcast. If you're going to have a conversation to other people, particularly the stakeholders involved in your project, plan out what your first couple lines are. Make sure you practice them so that when you're first starting out and you're a little bit nervous, that you know those first few lines so that once you start talking, usually you're pretty good at it. It's just getting started. That is usually the hardest part. So make sure you plan those opening lines and then don't bury the lead. I have heard so many people give presentations where the most important detail of the entire presentation is 40 minutes in. You're taking the risk that at 40 minutes, people lost interest, they walked away, They had to leave and go to another meeting. So you want to make sure that the most important part of your presentation is very visible and right up front. Practice what you're going to say to naysayers. Sometimes it's really important. Make sure that you practice how you're going to answer questions for people who are going to have negative responses to what you're saying, that you know how you're going to address those negative thoughts. Make sure that you make it easier for them to accept what you're saying. Be real memorable. And she says to find funny stories, finish big. Make sure that you have a big point at the very end that you put people in the right way so they can do the next step. After your big presentation, the next step is action. Summary. Make sure you look better by being relevant to what the company needs to happen. Be a translator from your customers, the other coworkers, for people who have responsibility inside the company. Two, improve the business. Make sure that what you're doing 
makes your company, your customers, and the products you're selling better. Three, identify a personal brand. That means what do people think of you? Try to figure out what you want your personal brand to be and then make sure that every project, every communication exudes that brand. Four, identify the stakeholders in your life. Those are going to be your bosses, your coworkers, people involved in your project, and your customers. Whoever has an impact on the work you're doing, identify them. And remember to make sure that you don't annoy them, you are brief with them, and that you don't fade away. And that you're brief and you give them exactly the information they're looking for. Five, don't disappear. It is so easy, particularly now while a lot of us are working remotely, to disappear in a company, to be in the corner of the room. When you show up late for meetings, a lot of times you disappear. When you show up first, you're front and present and greeting the customers or your other coworkers. Make sure that you are noticed, but realize that sometimes when you're noticed, it's also harsh to be noticed and that you're prepared to take some constructive and maybe some not so constructive criticism. Six, have presence and practice your story and your answers. A lot of times when you're coming up with great ideas for your company or projects that you want to work on, people will challenge it. Find out more about what your ideas are. Make sure you have ready answers and ready stories so that you can give the best possible responses. Challenge. Spend some time this week and write down who all of your stakeholders are. Are they your customers? Are they your coworkers? Is it your boss? Everyone. And write down those stakeholders in a gigantic list. And then next to their names, write down what they want. And then think about how you best can give your stakeholders exactly what they're looking for. And today's fun entertainment quote comes from Bernie Mac and Chris Rock in Head of State. So, baby brother, this is it, man. You ready? All right, I guess. What you mean you guess? You don't know you're either ready or you ain't. Hey, man. Problem, man. I I'm ready, okay? I I'm ready. No, you ain't. Look at you. If you call this ready, this ain't gonna get it. You gotta dress for the job you want, not for the job you got. Wait, man. I, I know you ain't talking about my come clothes. On, come, on, come on, now. Come on. This ain't about me. If I got a good idea, it shouldn't matter. Well, that's true. You always have to dress for the job you want and not the job you have. It's good advice, and there's just no one funnier than Bernie Mac and Chris Rock. All right, everyone, thank you so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Make sure that you use the Small Steps Pod website and contact me. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you have ideas or if you have questions for anything. Thank you very much. Have a great week.